evening. I'm Dr. Robbie Kilpatrick, and I'm the chair of the Health and Medicine Member-Led Forum at the Commonwealth Club of California. Tonight's program and the club's new virtual efforts are generously supported by the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and a collaborative of local funders and donors. We are grateful for their support and hope others will follow their example to support the club during these uncertain times. I'm delighted today to introduce a very special program in our Healthy Society series. The title is Ethics and Value in Health Crises. Um, our moderator today is Aaron Grizel, who is the Executive Director of the Northern California Martin Luther King Community Foundation and co-founder of the SIGE Center in Berkeley. Also, we welcome uh, Debbie Alvarez Rodriguez, who's a trustee of the Pacific School of Religion, and Dr. Dwight Hopkins Alexander Campbell Professor of Theology at the University of Chicago. So without further ado, I hand the program to you, Aaron. Thanks, Robbie. Hello, everyone, and thanks for uh, joining us here for this uh, very special program. by uh, Dr. King's wife, the late Coretta Scott King, uh, to be the official organization to uh, honor Dr. King's legacy here in the San Francisco Bay Area and the Northern California region. Uh, just this past year in 2019, we embarked on the founding of a new center, the SIDGE Center, the Center for Social Impact Development and Global Engagement. And this center looks at ways in which we can uh, imbue ethics and value uh, quantitatively into our uh, new AI environment in healthcare and in IT infrastructures. And so today I'm very happy to uh, bring uh, to you uh, two of the co-founders, uh, Dr. Dwight Hopkins and uh, Debbie uh, Alvarez Rodriguez. And so uh, we'd like to bring them to you now. Deb, how are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much, Aaron. And thank you, Commonwealth Club, for hosting this incredible conversation. And Dwight, how are you, sir? I'm doing very well. We're zooming in from Chicago. So I love to be in the Bay Area. So this is as close as I can come. So I deeply appreciate this conversation. Well, I'm sort of jealous. It's kind of interesting. I'm jealous because you may have better weather in Chicago right now than out here in the Bay Area, which is sort of an oxymoron as we speak. Uh, but but very good. So why, why don't we embark? We we started the, the SIDGE Center uh, uh, around a basic question of, of, of equity in our uh, IT infrastructures. And it was an idea that we were thinking through that would um, uh, uh, sort of find a way in which we can discuss uh, where, where the, the nexus is between the quantitative analysis that is uh, required in developing our algorithms that drive our AI infrastructures and where the question of ethics and value coincide with that quantitative analysis in order to drive more equitable outcomes as these new AI infrastructures are driving every part of our lives, right? Um, and so each of you comes to the table in the, in the co-founding of this center, each of you comes to the table with some very uh, interesting sort of backgrounds in, in approaching the idea of ethics and approaching the idea of value. Uh, that we want to cover. And today is a good time to do that because we are in the middle of the greatest pandemic around the world since uh, the 1918 uh, uh, pandemic. And so we want to cover um, how that's impacting our health crises uh, uh, today. Uh, and so, so, so Deb, I want to start with you uh, as we begin this conversation um, it, around this issue of, of value um, when it comes to where we are, sort of, sort of writ large, 
um, and how this pandemic sort of highlights some of the some of these large questions um, um, that are real concrete in our uh, in our society today. Well, well, thank you, Aaron. You know, it's it's interesting. I uh, besides serving on the board of trustees of the uh, Pacific School of Religion, I actually spent eleven years of my career as a public health official, uh, being the assistant director of budget and planning for the San Francisco Health Department. Uh, and this is actually my second pandemic uh, that I am going through. Uh, uh, it, it, the first one was as a young, new uh, public health worker uh, uh, in 1968, as the AIDS epidemic was uh, blowing up and we were trying to figure out what was going on and how was this happening and so forth. So, so it's, there's, a, there's an interesting perspective that I bring to this question. I think what we discovered back in with the uh, AIDS epidemic and the, the, the AIDS pandemic, what we see again here uh, with the COVID pandemic is, uh, is uh, the incredible toll on human suffering uh, that's happening across everybody, not just in the United States, but across the world at this point. It knows, these pandemics know no boundaries. And that actually can be pretty challenging when it comes to an algorithm because algorithms work on the premise of boundaries, right? And certain limitations and so forth. But these pandemics don't know that. So, so that's, that's one aspect that I think is critically important. I think the second aspect that we have, at least I have seen as a public health official now in my second pandemic, is that uh, inevitably uh, people of color and uh, people who uh, are uh, suffering from economic disadvantages have historically always been hardest hit and continue to be hardest hit. We're beginning to see it now. So, so as we're thinking about the role that algorithms and I, you know, sort of artificial intelligence play in healthcare in particular, which is increasingly being driven by these kinds of technological innovations, the one thing I always caution is to say that we can have great data and we can have much data, but data without wisdom uh, can lead to very perilous outcomes. And we've seen that happen in business, in the tech world, and in healthcare. Uh, so what I would sort of say as an opening is that, you know, when we think about uh, this interface of IT and healthcare and values, um, it is absolutely critical that we bring this multidisciplinary approach like this panel is to this conversation and the exploration of these critical questions. Thanks for that, Dwight. Can you can you pick up a bit uh, on that in, in modeling your career? I, you know, you one of the one of the foci of your career uh, uh, of your career as I've as I've followed it over the over these past years has been has been in the element of liberation theology, one, and then two, in these areas of connectivity when it comes to communities around the world being able to not only share their own experiences, but also being able to sort of share uh, uh, in, in ways in which, uh, in solution building, I can, I can say, and in, and in connectivities um, that we normally wouldn't associate with um, with groups that are disparate, you know, uh, internationally. And you've had you've done some seminal work through the Ford Foundation, of, uh, Ford Foundation Fellowship, and the like in that area. But I want to sort of get your get your cue on what that uh, how that informs sort of what what you bring to the table when we're talking about this particular subject. Thanks, Aaron. It's a great question, and I'm really enjoying having the time to share with Deborah. So this is our first out and hopefully it'll be many more. Um, well, specifically, um, I built a 14 country network, which included Asia, Africa, Latin America, Pacific Islands, North America, and um, Caribbean and Western Europe. Um, and a lot of what I've done there in terms of this global network, as well as other global work and linking it to the local here in the US, has been marked or deeply, profoundly impacted by the values and thinking of Martin Luther King Jr., who was actually a very liberationist person in his thinking, in his practice, and very global. So as you frame your questions, it's, as they say, spot on. And I think two foundational values that King had that speaks both to the global, what's happening now, particularly the pandemic, 
as well as the initial question you asked about what type of values can help us in dealing with artificial intelligence, you know, uh, internet of things, et cetera. So the two values that King always lived by, preached by, and connected to other people by. That is one that he always saw other people as human beings. This is a foundational value because uh, there's a danger and slippage of seeing others in a very utilitarian way. Uh, they're primarily objects or things to be used. Uh, how can I be, how can I manipulate them when I approach them? How can I use them to get things for my benefit? And those might be byproducts or in other arenas, but for King, the primary question is he saw other people as human beings. And for him, it was based on, he saw life, energy, and value in each individual person. You know, as a Christian pastor, he used more Christian language like image of God, but you can speak in broad terms. There's a life force in each of us that's precious, that's given to us at our birth, and it helps us see each other, each person as human beings. Um, for example, if we talk about AI and just spatial AI recognition, to me, that value of King affects both the input into that AI facial recognition and then how it's the output into the broader commercial world. So the people who are creating that AI facial recognition, they have to recognize that all people are human beings, everybody. So how type, what type of facial recognition prototypes do we use before the final product? So too, when it's marketed, it has to go down, as Deb said, in those dis disproportionately affected communities, whether they're rural America or urban America or you know, sub, sub suburban America. But both seeing all of us as human beings will help us focus technology to serve humans and not humans to serve technology. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second value in terms, in addition to human being that I get from King is the importance of seeing my own humanity based on the humanity of the other person. This is very fundamental because if I don't see my humanity linked into the humanity of other people, um, I won't even appreciate how deeply the disproportional impact of the virus and people of color and poor people's community is really an attack on my own humanity. So it's not just me trying to figure out a particular policy or just a handout, but my very being as a human being is linked to the survival and essence of their human being. So both seeing all people as human beings and two, really feeling in my body and my soul that my humanity as a human being on earth is connected and dependent on the survival of the other person's human being. And that other person, primarily poor people, urban people, and we must not forget women and children. Hmm. That, that, that's interesting because it brings us to what, to, to some, some of the essential sort of uh, uh, ideas and, and essential sort of quandaries that we're, we're forced to tackle when we are looking at some of uh, some of the ways in which we um, we think we ought to we ought to be looking at modeling, um, and and one of the things is uh, Deb we we talked about uh, a, a few days ago we, we talked about um, value and the prioritization of decision making um, when it comes to. Uh, uh, when it comes to these ideas of value, and this, and, and because we're in a pandemic, uh, there is this this idea of triaging that is that, that had been that had been uh, uh, that's in effect in a, in a lot of our decision making nowadays. Um, talk talk to me about uh, about some of the problems, pitfalls of that model, and and new ways in which maybe we can sort of start a conversation now. Uh, uh, between us, we can we can look at that uh, a bit differently. Well, it, it's interesting. I mean, you know, the the one of the fundamental uh, uh, protocols in healthcare uh, uh, around triaging, making decisions about who gets who gets to be treated, actually comes from the battlefield, right? It comes from wartime situations, and the concept really was around uh, in that context was the concept of uh, uh, survival of the fittest. Let us, uh, those who are closest to dying, leave them on the side. Those who are closest to being able to, 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 to serve so that they can go back to war, right? To go back to fight. Uh, uh, let's, put, let's get them through, right? And so that is the fundamental premise of triage that's still practiced in a lot of emergency rooms to this day across the United States. 
And what's been happening as, as, as data, the importance of data to really understand what's happening in our hospitals and who is coming to our hospitals and who is getting infected and who is dying of COVID and so forth, as we get access to those sort of disaggregated data, not the metadata that we use a lot of times in preparing algorithms, but the disaggregated data, it starts informing that maybe the very protocols of triage are actually inflicting even greater harm and greater suffering and greater death on the people that are most in need of help, right? So we're seeing that happening and, it's, and, and it, it made me, it was interesting because I was uh, listening to the uh, Federal Reserve Chairman uh, uh, who, who gave his talk today, uh, Jerome Powell, and he said something, uh, he was giving his state of the economy uh, talk and he said this, he says, the reversal of economic fortune has caused a level of pain that is hard to capture in words as lives are un upended amid great uncertainty and about the future, right? And mm -hmm. so he's sort of seeing this level of pain and he can't figure out what the right words are to describe it. Mm -hmm. Yet for lots of communities, people of color, communities of color, communities living with and dealing with disproportionate access to healthcare, to economic opportunities, to quality education and so forth, the experience of that pain and suffering is very real and very quantifiable in words and in actions and in deeds. The question is who's been putting that, do we have the opportunity and the avenues to put that information out, to articulate to have those words in ways that people are willing to listen and to act upon it. And so one of the things I started thinking about as we were talking about this triage model is, is there a different way of thinking about triage? What would happen if we upended the pyramid so that those who are our, um, our essential workers, which normally is for sort of populating the bottom of that pyramid, really those are the men and women who are providing access to all the essential services we need, including food, transportation, uh, care, and so forth. And if we flip that pyramid around so that not the fittest, supposedly fittest, and how we just de define that will leave up to a different discussion, but this, so that the supposedly fittest get access to uh, are most valued to those that are providing the greatest need and support become the most valued. What would that do to our triaging? Who would get access to healthcare in a different way? Who would be getting access to, vet to COVID testing, right? Mm -hmm. Certainly that bottom of that pyramid is not getting access to that testing. Yet we see and we hear from Washington DC that, uh, that our officials are getting tested every two to three hours mm -hmm. within the context of the White House, right? So here are, I think we have an opportunity to reimagine how we triage, who we triage, and what are the guiding principles and values that are informing our decisions. So, so that if we flip that pyramid this is if, if we look at it in economic terms lewis powell is, is, is an economic i mean jerome powell is an economic uh, uh, person right so so if we flip the pyramid where we've got um and, and we're seeing this um just concretely that our most east the people who are most important in our society right now are those who are providing the care the emergency services ensuring that we're able to get our uh, uh, our life-sustaining uh, uh, products. Um, that cohort is the cohort that right now we're seeing are the most important people in our society today. If we wanna talk about key persons, we cannot do without um, our uh, nurses, our EMTs, our firefighters, our, uh, uh, our grocery clerks, grocery, grocery clerks. Uh, we, we can't do without uh, them yet. Th our most essential workers seem to be the, the workers that are most uh, uh, sacrificial and sacrificed uh, uh, in society. And Dwight, you brought up something that was very interesting um, um, here that, that King uh, seemed to have that bottom up approach just as a as a general notion when it came to um uh his uh his personalism so uh, uh, that he that he came under that idea of the bottom up being 
um, those who are most important in society um, that we should value uh, um, the most, those positions that we should value, those people, those lives um, that we should value seem to be uh, something that was central um, in King's thought, yes? Yes, and I just love that metaphor, Deborah's about flipping the pyramid. I was trying to not levitate. I was like, yes, I'm there with you, sister. Um, and yeah, because it speaks uh, in general and specific to Martin Luther King's very uh, view on values of life and ethics uh, and the type of walk that he walked and talked that he talked. Um, for example, what's important is I read King um, and not some other values he raises is that the people who are, are at the bottom of the pyramid if we see, if we flip the pyramid, we began to change our perspective on them in two regards. One, we can believe and see that they have the power to change their own circumstances. And see, this is so important because what King was saying is that, you know, they have agency, right? They have the agency and that's the core of how social change comes about. And I think too, it's also key to how we're gonna get through uh, both the health and economic crisis of this US pandemic, but also globally. So if we see them as the folks who have the power to change their circumstances, that pushes us in a different direction. So we focus our energy, we look for our leadership, we look for the daily concerns that they have, how they live their lives. We'll focus our energy there and our resources there. It's not to negate other sectors of American society. Everybody has a role to play, you know, that's, but what I think King was pushing is just look, those people who are at the bottom of the pyramid as we flipped it, they actually, they have the power to change society. So that was one thing about flipping the pyramids. It's, it's a beautiful metaphor. The other thing is that when we, once we flip the pyramid and see that they have the power to change society is that they have the solutions to the problem. You know, they, they know what they live through. I give an example. I went to, I've been hunkered down here in Chicago in my house for like two months, just zooming myself to death. And so I said, let me go find out where some people are. So I went to a, a Costco in the far south suburbs of Chicago. And, you know, it was wrapped around Costco and you're six feet apart. But those people were talking, you know what? We stand out here. They could bring those swabs and take our tests right here. In fact, we don't need them. Just give us the, I was like, wow. It's like 500 like people right here who don't even want us. They want to do it, right? They have, they have the solutions they know. They were saying, yeah. If, they, if we get these pampers together, we can hook up our own daycare with the single mothers. I was like, what are they talking about? You know, they have the power and they know what the solutions are, right? And they had some things to say about politics and other people. That's another webcast. But it was just a beautiful thing. And it was just, a, it was like another village. It was like a, a community within the community emerging out of the crisis. And they weren't crying. They weren't had their heads down. They had power and energy to fight. And they also knew what the answers were. So... I think that, you know, King, as you go through his campaigns and his march on Washington, the last one, the Poor People's Campaign, it was clear to me that he felt that these people had the power to change society and they had the solutions to the problems if mm -hmm. we talked to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, one other, one last thing I want to add, uh, hey. Aaron, is that, you know, uh, we met our economy in the United States is a consumer driven economy. Mm -hmm. And the base, the power and the base that's driving that consumer driven economy are those, uh, is, that, is that base of that pyramid? Are those all those hundreds and thousands and millions of workers out there that are making sure the grocery stores stay open, making sure the meat processing gets done? All that. They actually drive this economy in this country in a way that is incredibly significant and rarely acknowledged, right? Rarely right. acknowledged. So it's, it's, it's all of what's been said and in addition, to do not underestimate the economic power that is driven by this, uh, uh, these, uh, these essential workers. Which, which, brings, which brings to, uh, to the fore this, um, the idea for me um, about, about the logic behind um, many of our, uh, uh, many of our uh, uh, AI, uh, 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 functions right um so so brandon wilkes uh one of our young sort of technology geniuses in this space um brought out a, a an idea that we uh that we have been bandying about a bit uh, about this idea of an essential worker versus a a 
a sacrificial worker or whether or whether our essential workers are are sacrificial workers rather than essential workers meaning that we can um, if something happens to an essential worker then they're expendable rather than valuable and deserving and needing to be um, um, restored and maintained because of our society's innate need mm -hmm. for uh, uh, that person. And, and, and Brandon brought out an idea is, is in questioning whether, and this is, I think is a good question, whether um, AI is able to differentiate between an essential worker or, or differentiate between essential and sacrificial in much of the logic that is that is placed within these very fun various functions that go into uh uh you know impacting all of our lives and what what it boils down to uh for me is that distilled from ai is distilled from the algorithms that create the rules for for uh, uh, the logic that goes into, they, they create the rule and that those algorithms are made and created uh, by people. I mean, they're variables that we have to wait and create in order to, in order to create these, uh, create the rules that are then driving uh, a various, you know, artificial intelligence function, right? Um, a logical function. So, so the idea of what value um, means in that space, just say in the idea of, a, of an essential worker, something very, uh, very interesting to look at, uh, particularly because um, there is empowerment. I mean, as you mentioned, Dwight, there, there's empowerment. Um, we don't have, to, there are solutions already there. And my fear is that much of what we are looking at in our, um, in our AI space is missing that whole layer of solutions and solution building um, because we're not looking for it in this space. Um, I'd like to sort of get you all's thought on um, ways in which, or, 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 or thought on sort of where we miss sort of the contextual aspect of, of sort of our our algorithm algorithms and ai uh sort of marriage and function there I'm, i'll jump in i'll start i mean you know if we look at this pandemic right when it first started it, uh and i think the one of the key things i want to really emphasize is the data that gets inputted has an incredible impact on the algorithms get that get created right uh so when the pandemic the COVID pandemic first started the focus was on Asia and in China. Uh, and then in relation to the United States, it was around people who were traveling, right? It was really focused around gathering data and reaching out to wealthy individuals and business leaders that had the ability to travel around, right? Because they were gonna be, they were the, the greatest risk for, uh, for transmission, right? So it was the, the more affluent, uh, 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 agile uh, individual. What, was, what we didn't have was we had no, and, and the data that was being collected was very blunt, right? People who could travel uh, from other countries, uh, and that was sort of the source of the data. What wasn't being looked at was actually what was happening in our local communities around infection rates uh, and people coming in with uh, excessive amounts of coughing and sneezing and all sorts of things like that. This was data that was available and being collected at local hospitals and so forth. And what was happening was that we were the, even back then at the very beginning, you could see the data was saying that African-American and Latinos were disproportionately being affected, right? We're coming in and uh, hospitalizations, uh, ER visits and so forth were disproportionately to population base higher for African-American and Latinos than any other population. So, the, 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 because we weren't paying attention to the data, the full disaggregated data, we started making decisions about who do we track, who do we contact trace, who do we test, that was missing where the pandemic was really having its greatest impact, right, in the local community. Um, 
So, and, the, and it leads to what we're seeing today. You know, I just, I was on the CDC website today uh, the, and they, at 3 p.m. they issued their data, right? 4.2, uh, 4.8, uh, for every 100,000 Americans, 42.8 African-Americans have died. This is as of three o'clock today. 19.1 Latinos have died from COVID related illnesses. 18.4 per 100,000 Asians have died and 16.6 .6 whites have died from, eight, from corona related uh, uh, illnesses mm -hmm. per, per 100,000 population. That is a startling set of numbers, right? And if those kinds of data are not figured into how we're creating our algorithms, okay, we will continue to come out with solutions that do not get to the course of, source of the problem. Uh, and we can see it, it's being played out right now with this pandemic and how healthcare is being uh, delivered, how PPPs are being distributed, how testing is being done. It's being done on a set of data initially that was false. And the only reason we have this data uh, at the disaggregated level around race, ethnicity, and gender is because there were grassroots community organizers that demanded this data to be gathered and collected and reported. D Dwight, you, D Dwight you, you have an international uh, view on this given, given, your, given your work with these 14 um, different countries and, and communities within these 14 different countries and piecing that together. Is there, so, is, is that something that you, um, what are the connectivities there in, 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 in what Deb was mentioning, um, which is startling. I mean, there's a three times, that's three times the rate of African-Americans at 48 per 100,000 and, 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 and white Americans at, at, at 16. Uh, per 100,000. That, that's just a startling and stark uh, contrast there. And I'd like to get, get your idea and I'm, uh, on, on the international uh, perspective in the communities and how that may um, inform what you see um, now in this, in, in this pandemic in, in that space. Uh, indeed, those are pretty sobering uh, statistics. You know, 3X uh, with the population is about 13.5% of the overall population. Um, right. When we put it in the global perspective, uh, my hunch and my you know, anecdotal study is that it's the same thing. You know, we have uh, communities are disproportionately impacted by, by, the, by the pandemic, uh, which is linked to some other structural health, political, economic, and job, and educational, and daycare, and housing issues. Um, so I like to do global connections and link it to the local here in the U.S. for a couple of things. One, I think it's very important for us to build an international network that's based on people to people. Mm -hmm. And I'm a both end person, not the either or. So you've got, you know, the World Trade Organization, World Health Organization, you've got denominations, you've got religious organizations, you've got educational institutions, you've got private equity and the World Bank. So, you know, Davos, you know, but what it, it seems to me what at the core of it is the people. This is the thing that King keeps saying. So I always look for where's the people to people relationship. And so I think it's important for people who are disproportionately impacted by this virus, they need, to, we, they need to get together to have an ongoing relationship, mm. whatever institutional form they develop, because we can use a crisis as an opportunity to build long-term relationships. That's the thing about the crisis. We have to put the fire out, but we have to figure out what were the, the, the ingredients that caused the fire. And that's the structural long-term perspective. And a key to that, that the engine we kept talking about is the people to people relationship. And then they can impact as, as the great work that Deborah mentioned in 68 with uh, AIDS and how the, the people from below pushed that whole movement. And I know she has some other interesting stories she shared before. Uh, so too on the global level, we can take that perspective. And, it, and, and when I built my 14 country network, People are just hungry for it. So it's not like, you know, it's some alien concept. The people are, they're hungry for it. It's just that they haven't had the ability to fly from a village in Zimbabwe all the way to, you know, Buenos Aires in Argentina or Jamaica, all the different countries we had. So we provided that infrastructure for them. 
And the most beautiful thing that happened is people realized that their local struggle against disproportionate impact, negative impact, is same globally. Mm -hmm. Once you get those people together, there's no turning back. And I also want to speak specifically in our network, the role of the women globally, because as we, we, our network focused on two things, youth and student education, and then women's advocacy. And we did the women's advocacy because as we've traveled internationally, and I'm sure all, both of you as well, if you touch the woman, as they say in South Africa, you touch the woman, you, you have struck a rock. In a more plain language, for whatever reasons, and I have some thinking about it, if you deal with the women, then you deal with the children, the culture, and the village. So it's very important, which includes all men as well. So again, I, I just get so excited when we, the possibility and the vision to, to, to see, let's link the local to the global. Let's build from the bottom up, but focus on the people. And again, all the other international mechanisms we have from all walks of life are welcome, but it seems to me that core has to be those people, the people-people relationship. And that's why I get excited about, you know, our new center that's focused a lot on King's values. Mm, mm. I do too. You, you, you know, what's interesting to me is, is when I think about, um, when, when I think about this idea between essential and sacrificial, um, the idea of duty comes up, right? Right. What does duty mean in a um, in a pandemic situation, right? And in a in, when we are in a when we are in a pandemic or in an emergency situation, what does duty mean when we think about um, um, an essential worker versus a sacrificial worker, and how that plays with what our um, idea of duty has traditionally been. Um, it's been associated with, with soldiers, it's been associated with, with war and, and, and duty, but you, you, when, when, you, when you serve, you get something back. There's the GI Bill. When you come back, you've got these home loans that you can get that are less, you know, that are more friendly. You, you, you've got the, this whole basket of education and, and insurance and all of this other stuff. What does, so, so there's a trade-off, right? But what does duty mean in this particular um, aspect? When you have a grocery clerk who is ensuring that you get your groceries and that you are able to feed yourself, or even a worker at the food bank, who is making sure that their food is packaged and that you can get it to be able to feed yourself? What what is this? What does duty mean? And what what do we as a society? What are we meaning when we talk about duty in this space? I'd like to sort of get your thoughts on that um, because I think that plays a lot into what we need to be thinking about wholesale. Um, into an idea of how we contextualize this, uh, a new way of thinking um, that can serve better in our, uh, you know, in our new AI environment. Uh, Deb, Deb, let me start with you with that. And then Dwight, I want you to, uh, want you to pick up on that um, um, idea on where, where it's come from, from our thinkers like Dolores Williams and, and, and you know, Howard Thurman and King, James Cone, those kind of folks, um, how they came to it. Well, I mean, I mean, I think, you know, as we were talking before we got over the phone, when we were planning this conversation, we really talked about this notion of duty uh, that comes with uh, often an oath and a covenant, right? That there is a relationship in the duty that creates mutuality mm -hmm. uh, uh, between people uh, and interdependence between people uh, that... Um, uh, that is, it's almost, it's almost familial, right? It's almost familiar. It's, that's how personal it is, right? So that's the, so what we're, so that, that would be the expectation. And certainly our healthcare workers are, my best friend is a doctor, uh, internist in New York City, and she's been on the front lines at Cornell Medical Center, dealing with almost 24 hours around the clock with people sick and dying, right? Uh, uh, much to the sacrifice of her own health and well being, right? But she took an oath. Right. She took an oath and she believes that there is a covenant. 
right, of service, right? Um, and that in turn, she's been given the privilege of going to a wonderful medical school and, and, and being on the faculty at Cornell Medical Center and so forth. But what we're seeing getting played out right now is this in this notion of essential versus sacrificial is that um, there is a duty that is being imposed, not a mutual, there is no mutuality around this, right? So, so and, and probably the greatest emphasis example of this is the majority of, uh, of um, essential workers are Latino and African-American. The data shows that, mm -hmm. right? Um, the number one, so given that you would say there is a duty to, to preserve them, right? Because they're, it, it, because they are essential to our well-being. Yet the latest data on, on unemployment shows that in April, right, Latinos are, are, are the population in the group that is, has the highest unemployment rate, right? Has lost the most number of jobs in this country to date since this pandemic. And in April, the unemployment rate in April for Latinos hit 18.9%, mm -hmm. followed by African-Americans at 16.7%. So mm -hmm. where is that pledge, that oath, that covenant of mutuality, right? That we, we, we should be bestowing upon our essential workers. And if, mm -hmm. if the result of, of almost it's forced labor, if the result of forced labor, either because of economic conditions, they cannot afford to not work uh, to maintain their families, or in the case of my niece, who works at a nursing home in New York City, uh, was told that she got the fever. She came down with COVID, she got the fever. And she was told that if she didn't show up to work, despite there was no PPPs or anything else, she would get fired. Mm -hmm. So she had to show up to work sick. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, where is that covenant, that mutuality, right, uh, of 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 uh, of respect and reliance and connection, uh, that I think was so essential to certainly Dr. King's uh, 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 teachings, uh, and certainly what we practice at Pacific School of Religion in terms of what it means to be a spiritually rooted transformational leader. Right? <laughs> Dwight, sort of ground ground that idea of duty and sort of the experiences that uh, of, of some of the thinkers there that we might be able to um, use in a bubble up sort of way. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that clash that that sort of clashed, uh, I should say, that sort of clashed with with the uh, with the traditional idea of duty, right? Right. So, so uh, where was that clash, and what and what can we take to sort of enhance um, our thought and idea of duty in a wholesome way that that can bring about greater equity in in in, in our space here? No, oh, awesome, awesome question. Great conversation. Um, I think there's one perspective of duty obligation is a type of blind duty and blind obligation. Mm -hmm. One that doesn't have uh, or doesn't allow for moral intervention or ethical practical intervention. And some of the thinkers that you mentioned earlier, including King, they would say that, yeah, we have a duty that when we operate in the public good and to deal with this virus and to do testing, get a vaccine, get people back to work when it's testing is appropriate, is in the public good. We have to pay attention not to blind duty, blind obligation, but especially emphasize duty to the most vulnerable. So we keep coming back to that, however we chop, chop it up or, or whatever perspective we take. Because um, I could imagine, for example, just to come back to duty and try to connect it to your an earlier question about artificial intelligence and the bias there in terms of values. For example, what if um, we were able to do prototypes, we were able to involve you know, the East Oaklands, it used to be the East Oakland when I was there, and the South Sides of Chicago's and the old Northwest Washington, D.C. and the previous 125th Street Harlem has changed and now with Disneyland there. Mm. Actually, all these places I've lived in, I used to live in Oakland. What if we were to allow them to participate in the programming of these, you know, cutting edge and valuable AI products, you know? So one, and it, there's a duty to the, you know, there's a public good, but within the public good, the duty needs to be biased toward the people who are most vulnerable. And again, 
I could imagine, and we could probably think of right here, how that would work. I could see on certain parts of South Side of Chicago where um, some of our incubators, which are downtown in Chicago, what if we had a, a satellite there, you know, and provided those people jobs, did uh, IT, uh, uh, computer programming, coding with the kids in the neighborhood after school, um, provided daycare for them. Don't raise the prices of the housing or the, or the rent. That has to be part of the duty too. The duty to not displace the people who live there. But let's let's merge them. We don't have to fight each other if we have the right perspective. And we are we're, and our duty is to the public good, which you know I'm a citizen. I've been here for several generations, so I feel a sense of the public good. But my sense of duty to the public good keeps an, a, both an ear and an eye out and a nose for those communities most disproportionately impacted. And I think the AI and the, the algorithms and all that awesome and sobering data that Deborah mentioned would be uh, greatly changed, if not greatly impacted, if the physicality of the algorithm data processing were in those communities. Again, mm -hmm. making sure that the rent and the housing prices don't go up and the tax base to displace them. So that has to be a key um, because you know we can change the communities and don't have any people there that were originally there. So I get excited about bringing in these folks who don't have a voice, who don't have a physical being, a physical part of this whole AI technology process. And again, I think once people have their bodies in, in the mix of all of this technology stuff, they will begin to contribute to the conversation. They will also bring certain values that they have. Those communities know, I mean, the ones that Deborah mentioned, like in 68 HIV AIDS and the communities she's working with through PSR and San Francisco and the probably global stuff we don't know about, those folks have knowledge. They do. It goes back to what King was saying. We have to see that they have answers to the, to the they have solutions to the problems. So I think those are some of the things that, you know, that I get excited about. And, um, you know, technology is going to be here for a long time. And I think it has a great role, potential to play and bring it down some of these statistics in terms of people of color and poor folk, both the negative statistics, who's just, you know, the 3X impact, that's incredible, as well as the lower this unemployment piece. And again, within that, we got to keep coming back to poor folk, particularly poor women and children, because I think that's part of the key link in this whole process. The, I, I want it. Can I, can I go, make, ahead, I, Deb, go ahead, Deb. I Deb. misspoke at the very beginning because I, I have dyslexia. So I said 68 and I meant to say 86. 86 the AIDS, yeah. AIDS pandemic was 80, you know, yeah, 81. Yeah, yeah, the first that. AIDS case was 81 and yeah. I came to it in 86. So I just want to make that correction. Yeah. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. Uh, but I want to end, I, I want to end on um, uh, or, or conclude a, 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 our, our final sort of uh, uh, thoughts. On, the, on connecting sort of what each of you thinks is sort of the key node that we can take away in thinking about what can connect, what we can use to connect sort of the, the larger ideas of ethics and value sort of writ large into an idea of, uh, of uh, of an algorithm, how can we quantify what are the what are the elements that that each of you thinks we can use in this space to quantify to be helpful in um, um, in our new technology uh, uh, you know spaces uh, uh, and and our AI spaces that can be helpful in that. Um, we've got these grand notions of duty, of ethics, of value. How, what do what can we use to distill into a, into quantifiable form that we can begin to sort of sort of sort of play with uh, uh, there, Deb? Well, I mean, I think a couple of things. You know, connecting to what Dwight was saying that ultimately it's about the people and uh, and uh, uh, and connecting ourselves to uh, with uh, with uh, people that are most disproportionately being negatively impacted uh, is is critical. Uh, but at the same time, because we're in the realm of AI and, uh, and algorithms, we need to, as I said, there's a couple of th key things. Collect disaggregated data by race, uh, ethnicity, primary language, geography, socioeconomic status, and uh, ability or disability. I think it's critical, right? We see over and over again, if the data is, only, is, only, is always centered to the majority, white, 
uh, population, the outcomes will be, uh, and the outcomes of those algorithms will be uh, horribly uh, uh, unjust for uh, communities of color and communities that are dealing with poverty. The other thing I think we need to do is have, again, our grassroots communities, our grassroots leaders, track the flow of public and philanthropic dollars, right? To understand how spending is happening by race, income, and place, right? Because we do these big plays in philanthropy and in public sector, and then we find, as we've seen with the COVID monies, that why are these uh, 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 billion-dollar companies getting the aid that was meant for uh, uh, grassroots uh, workers, right? So we have to be able to track and build our algorithms that track not just the data, but the flow of money. And then the third, I think, that's critically important is to understand that we have to, as we're thinking about public policy, because these are structural issues, right? These are structural racism, structural economic disadvantages that are existing. As we're thinking about public policy, we as public policy individuals, whether we are voters or whether we are uh, elected officials, have to understand the, uh, the compounding effects uh, that uh, race and identity and conditions are happening. So when we look are happening around the health and well-being and opportunities for people, right, in terms of the structural racism. So, you know, as a policy person who was responsible for developing uh, access to health care for all children in San Francisco under 18 before there was even Obamacare or anything like that, the way we got to that was by having the people in the communities actually being our architects of the policy. They were our thought leaders. They were our data collectors, okay? They were our analysts, and they were the people that were actually developing the uh, language for our public policy, right? And the outcome was we get radically different outcomes when we have the people directly involved and when we make a commitment to having an equity focus on how we do our work, regardless of the work we do. Mm -hmm. That, th th thanks for that, Deb. Dwight, that sort of tracks with, with your last comment about, uh, you know, about moving, moving policy and moving those, those, those centers of thought and solutions to the communities that are most affected so that those communities can uh, have a concrete uh, uh, place um, in the space to, to, to build answers. Right. Yeah. yeah, I think it's awesome. Um, I think a lot of the solutions um, that Deborah's mentioned, I would say, you know, right on, as we used to say back in the day. Um, and I know that uh, this part of my journey, you know, is, uh, is this, you know, my gray haired part now is to think in terms of uh, intergenerational legacy. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of the communities, particularly on the south side of Chicago, and also, you know, west side, where a lot of Latino, Latino Hispanics live, that we somehow have got to have some type of intervention in the structural long-term systemic um, reality that they face. Um, in terms of the IT piece, I would love to see uh, a coalition of folk come together. At the core of it would be the organic community organizers. They may not have the titles, but they may be the ones who run the tenements or you know, the women who, who pick up the trash, you know, anything like that at a core. And then bring in other parts in this larger coalition. And part of what I'm thinking about is what King tried to do, and he did do. You would also bring in um, other poor people from other racial ethnic groups. That's gonna be a struggle I know in Chicago. There's a very you know, strong segregation tradition, but the vision is to have a long-term intergenerational. At the core, community organizers, organic people who lead those communities to have respect. Um, you can bring in folks from, you know, whether they're the doctors or investors or religious leaders or educators or um, athletes and entertainers. Um, I'm really key on trying to leverage a lot of the wealth that we have, particularly in specifically the African-American community. Mm -hmm. um, but how do we leverage it in such a way that at the forefront of those organic community people, particularly uh, poor people and women of color. Mm -hmm. So I think that's so I could imagine if we had a 200 acre, like in Napa somewhere, <laughs> we brought a lot of young people from the South Side of Chicago, whatever, I used to be old Northwest in DC, uh, East Palo Alto, if it's still there, East Oakland, I used to be, you know, we can go on and on, you know, Churchill, well, I'm from Richmond, Virginia, 
and have a summer training program for them on what the future can be. In fact, the slogan would be youth, students, and women, another world is possible. Mm. You, you're speaking to my heart. I mean, you know, uh, uh, one of the things that we tell every incoming student at the Pacific School of Religion, uh, we, we tell them when they arrive, there are three things that we promise you. Uh, and we promise to blow your mind. <laughs> we promise to strengthen your hand. And we promise to embolden your heart. Oh, okay? yes. And if we, particularly with our young people in that campus in Napa, mm -hmm. you know, if we do that and bring and let them really start architecting, oh, yeah. uh, uh, they're much better at AI and technology than I am and my generation is. We let them. Mm -hmm. what, what will be unleashed in terms of the power of creative change and positive change uh, and, and really transform, transformative impact, it will, will, will truly blow my mind. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, I, I, hey, well, I want to thank you. I, I want to thank you both. We, we have, you know, some of our conversations in the past, we can, we can continue and continue and continue and, and, and uh, you know, sort of get cut off on the <laughs> on the technology side because we're talking too long. Uh, but we feel, I want to thank, I want to thank both, both you, uh, Deb and Dwight um, for, for such a stimulating uh, conversation and sort of serving as the launch pad um, for our new uh, Center for Social Impact Development and Global Engagement here. And I want to thank the, uh, the Commonwealth Club for being such a, uh, such a great host, and for Robbie Kilpatrick, the chairman of the Health and Medicine member-led forum for this piece here. Um, you can always find out more about the NorCal MLK Foundation by going to norcalmlkfoundation.org. There you can find out more about the SIG Center and uh, about getting involved uh, with us. And with that, I want to kick it back to Robbie Kilpatrick. Robbie, thank you again. Well, th thank you, Aaron and Deborah and Dwight. This was a, a very informative discussion. I learned a lot today and you definitely touched my brain and you touched my heart. Uh, it was a great conversation and uh, it's a highlight of my day. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about the SIG Center, the new Center for Social Impact Development and Global Engagement. And if you need anyone to, uh, you know, carry someone's bag at the Napa campus, give me a call. <laughs> um, thanks you can for bring the wine. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. Thanks yeah. go out to all of you, but also to our audience, uh, all the folks behind the little green button at the top of our computers, um, and to the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and a collaborative of local donors and funders who have supported tonight's program in extremely difficult financial uh, situation for all of us. Uh, we invite you in the audience to join them. And how you do that is on the website, www.commonwealthclub.org. Even small donations are appreciated. The Commonwealth Club of California has for 117 years offered enlightened discussion to the public based on civility, which was demonstrated so perfectly by our speakers today. Please check out our other programs that bring speakers from across the spectrum of society, talking about many of the challenges that you have referred to today. Thank you and have a good evening, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Thank you so much.